Isaiah chapter 29 is where we pick it up tonight. And God declares through Isaiah the prophet to the city of Jerusalem, he said, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. And so that tells us that it's a reference to Jerusalem. Um, Isaiah is giving Jerusalem a different name uh, here as God is promising to humble Jerusalem. He gives it the name of Ariel. And the word Ariel was a word that referred to uh, uh, the flat place or the hearth, the stone hearth where the sacrifices would be offered. And so God is referring here uh, to Jerusalem, and uh, he speaks of this city that at one time in his eyes was the place where he would bring his people three times a year to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices to God. And there was a day in Jerusalem when Jerusalem and the sacrifices that were offered were a sweet fragrance to God. It was pleasing to God. And now God declares all of Jerusalem to be Ariel. In other words, He's going to light the entire thing on fire. He's going to make the entire thing a sacrifice uh, because of their rebellion against Him. And uh, again, as we look at that here in uh, chapter 29, uh, we consider, let me move this just for a moment. Carlia will get you situated again. You come back up. But you think about a father's heart and how this must have broken his heart uh, to speak of this kind of judgment uh, against his children, against these people, uh, because they would not change from their rebellion against him. And I mean, how far they provoke the Father's heart. I, I don't know how to produce it in another person's heart. I don't know how to produce it in my own heart. Except for through the Word of God and by the Spirit of God. But for there to be an awe and a reverence in my life concerning rebellion against God, that it wouldn't be a casual thing. It wouldn't be something that just because it's so prevalent that I would lower my guard or in my own life or to fail to see it as the heartbreaking thing that it is to God in what it forces a father to do in a child's life. And he longs to bless. He longs to prosper. This is what he wants to do. And my rebellion makes him express himself in a way that he never wants to express in our hearts. And I'm thankful for the work of the Holy Spirit. Not just the Spirit of God. But that God calls His Spirit a Holy Spirit. And I'm glad He is a Holy Spirit. And I need Him to raise that standard within my heart so that there's an abhorrence within my heart to willfully rebel against Him. It's one thing not to know, you know, what is right and wrong early in my walk and to do what's wrong and then read the Bible and discover later, oh my, what have I done here, God? I'm sorry here. Now, now build this into my life. But it's another thing to walk with the Lord for years as they had, to know better than to rebel against Him anyway. And that's, that's what they were doing. The fearfulness of rebellion. The price that a human life pays for it. The terrible price that He pays. The terrible price that He pays for our rebellion. And so here he says, I'm going to have to cause all of Jerusalem to become aerial, to become 
and altar hearth. I'm going to have to cause it to become one blazing hearth. He said, add year to year, let feasts come around, and yet I will distress Ariel. There will be heaviness and sorrow. And it shall be to me as Ariel, I will encamp against you all around. And the Assyrians uh, were surrounding Jerusalem at this time. And I will lay siege against you with a mound, and I will raise siege works against you, and you shall be brought down. You shall break, uh, speak out of the ground. Your speech shall be brought low out of the dust. Your voice shall be like a medium's out of the ground, and your speech shall whisper out of the dust. And so God promised to humble them to that degree. And moreover, the multitude of your foes, as God begins to talk about uh, how he was even in their rebellion, there, there ultimately Jerusalem would fall to the Babylonians. They were currently being laid siege by the Assyrians. And he speaks about uh, the devastation that he was going to bring upon the Assyrians in verse 5. Moreover, the multitude of your foes shall be like fine dust, and the multitude of the terrible ones shall be as chaff that passes away, you know, gone with the wind and forgotten. Yes, it shall be in an instant suddenly, and you shall be punished by the Lord of hosts, he says to the Assyrians, with thunder and earthquake and great noise, with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire, the multitude of all the nations who fight against Ariel, even all who fight against her and her fortress and distress her, shall be as a dream of a night vision. It shall be as when a hungry man dreams and he's eating in his dream. Ooh, man, all right. I can I have seconds of that and all that? So he's eating in his dream and then he wakes up and his soul is still empty. Or as when a thirsty man dreams and looks, he, he drinks, but he awakes and indeed he is still faint and his soul still craves. It still craves the water, and so the multitude of all of the nations shall be who fight against Mount Zion. Now, in chapter 37, God is going to give us a little fuller look into this whole thing, his destruction of the Assyrian army. God wipes out 185,000 frontline Assyrian troops in one night uh, with an angel. And, uh, and so he brings them low, just as he said. And there are the Assyrians. And I mean, here God is doing everything that he can to, you know, buy these people time so they'll come to their senses and repent and turn back to him. And so here's the Assyrians as they're in place to, you know, overtake Jerusalem. And I mean, they can already, you know, they've, they're like a guy that's just, they can already taste the meal. They can always already drink the water. I mean, just like they're going to take them. This is all going to be ours Soon, And God says, when I do what I do, it's going to be like a dream for them. They're not going to believe how real it seemed to them. And then, boom, it was gone. It was gone. And that's what God was going to do uh, as it related it to um, the Assyrians. Um, it must be, if God... I think of how frustrating that victory of God against the Assyrians must have been. There they are. They have wiped out all of the surrounding nations around uh, Judah. They have wiped out the entire countryside of Judah. The only thing they haven't been able to take is the actual city of Jerusalem itself. And it's under siege. It's about to be taken. And God comes in in the middle of the night and he wipes out their entire army by an, by an angel. And that's, that's what he was doing here just to buy time for a rebellious people. Imagine what he quietly does for us that we don't have any idea of as we walk with him and, as, and walk with him faithfully. It must be very frustrating to be the devil day in and day out. I, you know, I don't know, we don't know one-tenth of what goes on around our lives on a daily basis. The deliverance that occurs all of the time around our lives how often we must just look like, you know, lunch meat on some wheat bread. I mean, Satan can taste us. He's going to eat us for lunch. And, and then God does this and he does this and he does that. And all of a sudden, 
boom, like a dream, it's gone. I mean, he had us right in his jaws, I mean, out of his jaws. Beautiful. I love the fact that Satan, I trust that he's frustrated on a daily basis, and I know that he is, by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of God, all grace as we walk with him. It's important that we walk faithfully with the Lord in the midst of all of that. He says in verse 9, pause and wonder. Blind yourselves and be blind. They are drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. And uh, so here God describes uh, the southern kingdom of of Judah. He describes them as blind. Uh, He describes them as drunk. And then in verse 10, uh, he describes them as deaf. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. And so he's talking about uh, uh, because of their pride, they were drunk on their pride, and because of their pride, they were blind. And, uh, and that's, that's the thing that uh, pride does. And I love it. That's why I'll repeat it again. But the first thing that pride does in our lives is it eliminates our capacity to recognize it. That's why it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous. When pride begins to roll in my life, it destroys, first of all, my capacity to recognize it. I'm too proud to know that I'm proud. Now I'm blind. Now I can't recognize it. What's my only hope in that situation? This book, this book, and the hands of the Holy Spirit. That's my only hope. And so here they are, uh, blinded, and with their pride, they're drunk on their pride, and they were silencing the prophets and, and the seers, and so they were deaf. Listen, any army that is going out to war, drunk, blind, and deaf, what's going to happen to them? You're a dead duck. You're a dead duck. And that's what they were doing. It wasn't just the battle that was going to happen with the Assyrians and later on with the Babylonians. There's a whole world that wanted to wipe out the Jews. Why? Because Satan wanted to wipe out the Jews. Where was the Messiah going to come from? Through the Jews. And so the battle that we're in the middle of every single day, it's a huge battle. We don't even know the half of the purposes of God surrounding our lives. Maybe they'll be manifest once we get into heaven. But we have no chance, not in a physical battle and not in a spiritual warfare, to be drunk or to be blind or to be deaf. And that's what they were in their rebellion. When a person is walking in rebellion to God's known will and His Word, That's the condition that they're in. And uh, again, uh, Satan's going to have a heyday with that kind of a person. And so he said in verse 10 again, For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. And so they were deaf because of their disobedience against God. Uh, Sometimes... People don't want to hear the Word of God. And, uh, and uh, sad to say, sometimes many professing Christians don't want to hear what the Word of God has to say for their situation. And in their mind, nothing could be worse than hearing the Word of God. There is something worse. Silence. Silence. When I reach that desperate place in my life and now I want to hear what it is that he has to say and he's taken and he's covered the heads of the seers and he's closed the eyes of the prophets. There's something worse than his word even when my flesh doesn't want to hear it. And that's if he goes silent on me. And So never take the word of God for granted. Don't ever take the voice of God for granted. And it almost seems like a stupid idiot thing to say. But, I mean, it's almost like you have to just say, you know, come in, come in, come in, you know, sanity, you know, headquarters trying to come in. 
if we actually believed that God is God and that He speaks and that His Word is the Word of God, who in their right mind would disregard it? Who would disregard the Word of God? And so you stop and you think about that. The Word of God, God Almighty, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, been around before anything was ever around, infinite in every way. You can be infinite. And He talks to me. And I discard that? That's craziness. It's craziness. If I stop and think about that just a little bit, and yet that's exactly what they were doing. And God said in verse 11, The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, Read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it's sealed. And then they take the book and they deliver it to one who can't read, saying, Read this, please. And he says, I'm not literate. I can't read this for you. And what God is saying is that his book became sealed because of their disobedience. Because of their disobedience. God's book seals because of disobedience. Willful disobedience to the Word of God is a sure way to silence this book in my life. And that's doing a lot. That's doing a lot. Willful disobedience. Because if I won't obey Him in what I know He is saying, then why should He reveal any more to me? Why should He reveal any more to me? And Jesus said it. In John chapter 14, verse 21, he said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And then notice this, I will love him and manifest myself to him. He manifests himself to the obedient. He gives further revelation concerning his will and the things of himself to those that are willing to obey what he has revealed thus far. And so the book was closed because of their obedient, disobedience. And the interesting thing, verse 12, is a frightening kind of verse because the book seals up to them and a day comes when they want to rehear the Word of God and the voice of God and that day does come. And then now they're so desperate they hand the book to someone who can't read. That's the height of desperation. The height of desperation. And yet, that's the life of rebellion. There's a life of rebellion. Is that one day there will be that kind of of desperation. I should never assume that this will open up to me again in my rebellious state. Best to repent, return to Him, and then He'll be glad to open things up to us. In verse 13, He begins to rebuke their uh, religious uh, activity in that day. The fascinating thing is that in all of this, in Jerusalem, the temple was full. Uh, We would say today, the churches were full. I mean, just astounding. Here's the condition of where they're at, and yet no room in the churches. No room in the temple. But none of it was pleasing God. He said, inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths. They had all the God talk down. You get that down, it takes you about six months as a new Christian, then you get it all down, and then you um, realize the curse that it is the rest of your Christian walk. Uh, if, if you say it apart from a reality in your heart. And, and so they had all of the God talk down, the praise the Lord and amens and all this kind of stuff. He said, inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and they honor me with their lips, but they have removed their hearts far from me. And that was their condition. They had all of the externals going on. They knew how to say all of the right things, dami-nami-namis and all these different things that they could do, all of the lips, all of the activities and all that kind of stuff. But their heart was detached from what it was that they were involved in. It's kind of like today. It's a kind of person that kind of soothes their own conscience uh, by simply attending church. Um, uh, so, I'm living in rebellion to God. I uh, know what's right. Um, I know what I should be doing, and I'm not doing it. Um, I think I'll go to church and uh, put five bucks in the offering and, you know, and, 
you know, he'll understand. That, that kind of a deal. And uh, sing all the songs. And, oh, I'm glad they have the song sheets and everything. They sing all of the songs and everything. Pure self-deception. Pure self-deception. To think that my heart can be in one place in its attitude towards God and my lips in another place praising Him while my heart is in rebellion and somehow that's supposed to bless Him. It, it, it doesn't bless Him. God isn't fooled by it at all. What that is, is that is as pure a work of superstition as, as occurs anywhere else in the world. And it occurs every single Sunday in the United States of America. The heart has, the lip has to be, the mouth has to be an overflow of a reality in the heart. Or it's not a blessing to God at all. There needs to be that heart reality there where my heart really believes the things that I'm singing to God, really believes the things that I'm saying to God. God doesn't want just, you know, this bunch of religious talk. And again, the capacity for acting that is in every one of us. So that just, you know, 3,000 years ago or whatever it might be, the capacity within each of our hearts. And it's an ongoing work of the Holy Spirit to keep our prayers real, to keep our songs real, to keep our lips in alignment with a heart that is submitted to Him. And so these religious words that they were giving wasn't a reflection of their heart. And so in God's mind, it was worse than silence. Have you ever had someone flatter you because they kind of felt that they needed to? <laughs> and you know they hate your guts. You know, they don't believe a single thing you say. They don't care one bit about you. If you drop dead tomorrow, they wouldn't even, you know, uh, stop uh, reading the newspaper related to it. And when someone comes up and sings your praises, and you know that's the condition of their heart, how wonderful is their praise to you? It, it disgusts you. Silence would be better than that. And that's what God was saying to them. That's what he was saying to them. And, and so here's all of this acting that's going on and God's saying, listen, a slap across the face would be easier to endure than all of this. And he said, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. And so the fear that people had or the respect or the reverence that people had for God they didn't have it because out of their own personal relationship with God. It was something that was taught them uh, by the teachers. Now, you need to have a respect for God. You need to have a fear for God. But, you know, if you get your own personal relationship with God, it comes out of that. You don't need a preacher every week to, you know, hammer a person into submission. And uh, it, it, it just comes out of that personal relationship. There's that respect for Him. There's that reverence for him. And so here these things were in their lives. Their fear towards God was taught as a commandment of men. It didn't, it didn't come. It, it, it came you know, out of, of the teachers in, in those days rather than just out of a personal relationship. You know, there are some things that just have to happen between me and God, and they can't happen through any other person. And it's not the preacher's responsibility to produce the fear of God in the lives of God's people. That either comes out of a personal relationship with God or it never happens. I can never produce it in another human life. The fear of God, it's not my responsibility. But I think sometimes there's enormous uh, pressure put upon the church or put upon the pastor to produce a certain thing in people's lives. That's not his responsibility. And he can't do it. He can't do it. That has to happen between an individual and God. That's where it, it has to be. And so uh, this was what was going on. Verse 14, Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among this people, a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent shall be hidden. 
God says, all right, I'm going to do a marvelous work. God says, the marvelous work that I'm going to do for you, uh, a miracle that I think you really will appreciate. He says, I'm going to hide from you and allow you to live under your own wisdom. That's what he was saying there. He's saying, you don't want my wisdom. You don't want to take me seriously. He said, there's a cure for that. I'll leave you to your own wisdom and see how you do. That's a sure cure for pride, is to be left to my own wisdom. And uh, so that's what God does. Now, fascinating that here was a God who delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the world, we would say. Delivered them out of Egypt, able to do that. Now he faces a more formidable opponent in their pride. In their pride. Fascinating, is it? The danger of our own pride and our own being impressed with our own wisdom. God says, you're all impressed with your own wisdom. Then you can have your own wisdom and uh, talk to you when you're sick about it. Verse 15. Woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel far from God and their works are in the dark. He's talking about his people that had a hidden life, had a dark life, a life that they felt that they had uh, hidden from God. And uh, he said, woe to that kind of a person. Uh, surely, one of the greatest uh, exercises in futility in all of the world would have to be trying to hide from God. And one of the reasons is, uh, and I, think I, I consider it a fairly large reason, is that he's everywhere all at the same time. Uh, makes it very hard, very hard to hide from him. And one of the fascinating things is that among these people, and if it entraps our own heart, it, it takes more time and it takes more energy to hide and to live a secret life than it ever does to repent. It takes a ton out of us to live a secret life. I mean, just the uh, resources, mental, emotional, physical, that pour out to live that kind of a life. And then when I finally turn from it, and I turn to God, and I'm free from that, there's that realization, God, I didn't know how much that was taking out of me to try and hide from You. And I was unsuccessful in it altogether. And so he speaks about to them as they thought just because they were doing their idolatrous things in, in the dark that God couldn't see it. Like he's got to get those special glasses, you know, military glasses. Oh, oh look what they're doing! Ah, oh, where have I been without these glasses? They were sneaking around doing all kinds of vile things. No, he's right there in the middle of it. And they say, who sees us? And who knows? And God said, surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed by the clay? For shall the thing made say of him who made it, he did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? And so God says, you guys have got it all turned around. He said, you know, you think that you can hide from God. But he's saying here, God can hide from you, but you'll never hide from God. And that was what he was warning them, was if you continue to hide from me, instead of coming clean, then I will do what you can never do with me. I will hide myself from you. And again, that's a severe penalty. A severe penalty. Someone has said that what we are it, it's this, the saying, I, f I forget it, but it's, it's like um, what we really are is what we are when we're alone. When we're alone. And when we're alone in the dark. That's the test. Not, not here under the spotlights. That's not the test. The test is what is my life quietly and privately when the only audience is God, the only audience is God. That's the revelation of where we are, where I am spiritually. And so there's no hiding from God. And they were self-deceived into thinking that they could hide from God. And then God jumps as he begins to talk about, 
you know, it's, again, it's almost like he can only handle dealing with so much bad news before he has to jump to the good news, which means he's got to go into the millennium when Jesus is going to return and he's going to reign for a thousand years. So he begins to talk about that in verse 17. And he said, Is it not yet a very little while till Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field and the fruitful field be esteemed as a forest? In that day the deaf will hear the words of the book. So unlike in their rebellion, the deaf are going to hear uh, the word of God. The eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity and out of darkness. The humble shall also increase, uh, increase their joy in the Lord. And the poor among men shall rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. For the terrible one is brought to nothing. In, under Jesus' reign, in that millennial reign, no more oppressors. No more fear on the earth. Uh, the scornful one is consumed. There will be no more scorn of God. And I, I have to be careful because I tend to scorn scorners. <laughs> which isn't always the best task. But again, when I became a Christian, so disgusted with my own wisdom, so disgusted with man's wisdom, that when I see it exalted in the world, man's wisdom, in comparison to other forms of man's wisdom, I can deal with that. That rolls off me okay. But when I see man's wisdom, i.e. stupidity, exalted above the Word of God and the Word of God scorned, it, it provokes something within me that sometimes I like to think it's holy, but sometimes I have to really seek the Lord related to it. You know, as they, said, as they saw Jesus, the zeal of the Lord of hosts has consumed Him. There's a place for that but not on, on the fleshly level. But here is this thing where the scorn of God is going to end. No more of this scorning and mocking of God. Well, what's, what's Hollywood going to do? They're going to have to plant oranges there again. And all who watch for iniquity are cut off. So the rebellious, the sinners, they'll be cut off who make man an offender by word. And so those that try to trap people into their sin... That's going to be laid by the way. So that's going to be nice. The enticers into sin will be taken out of the way and lay a snare for him who reproves in the gate and turn aside the just for the thing of naught. And so that temptation is going to be removed. And of course, we live here in the United States where we have this freedom of speech. And, uh, and so every manner of temptation is put before Mankind and there's constitutional rights for it. What a terrible price we pay. Uh, there are people um, in this country that the worst thing that they could ever do is take that first drop of alcohol because they'll end up addicted to it the rest of their life and they'll only be delivered of it by the Lord Jesus. There are others, the last thing, the worst thing that they should ever do is is, you know, to partake of a cigarette or to partake of drugs, these things that hook. But increasingly, the thing that is grabbing, and not just grabbing, you know, anyone and everyone, but grabbing the pastors, taking them out of the way, is the pornography today. So much of it. And, and so you have all of this enticement, all the lure of of all of it that's around of it, so much of, you know, the technology and all of these kinds of things and, and that temptation, it's just always there. It's always there. And, and uh, one day, no temptation. Just to remove it. No opportunity to express that side within our lives. And whatever it might be. For someone else, it may be malls. You see, no malls in the millennium. It's right in here somewhere on the thing. I was, you know, driving home and one day and, um, you know, thinking about some of these issues. And, of course, you know, when I was growing up and I was much younger, I'd be there were adult bookstores in town and that kind of thing. 
but they were relegated to certain areas and and uh, fairly small and that kind of thing. And what's happened today is you can drive through just an average neighborhood and maybe four out of ten are full-blown adult bookstores because of that, because of what that's hooked up to. And to just surf and surf and surf and surf and surf. And so that temptation that's all around us all of the time, all of the time, one day in the millennium, no one enticing others to sin. Hip, hip, hooray. You know, it, it means very easy to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy, Lord, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord, these days. Verse 22. Therefore, thus says the Lord who redeemed Abraham concerning the house of Jacob. Jacob, referring to Israel and Judah, shall not now be ashamed. They were ashamed at the moment, but God was saying the days coming when they won't be ashamed, nor shall his face grow pale, but when he sees his children, the work of my hands in his midst, they will hallow my name and hallow the Holy One of Jacob and fear the God of Israel. These also who erred in spirit will come to understanding, and those who murmured will learn doctrine. And so one day in Israel, there won't be that uh, uh, being impressed with their own wisdom. They'll turn to the wisdom of God. Chapter 30. Isaiah in chapter 30, he continues to cry out to Israel. Uh, They continue to be surrounded by Sennacherib and by uh, the Assyrians. They're in a tremendous crisis. And uh, ultimately, in that crisis, uh, King Hezekiah turned to the Lord at the last moment, and uh, deliverance came uh, through the Lord in the wiping out of the Assyrians in chapter 37. But he continues his woe upon uh, the children of Israel, and he says, Woe to the rebellious children. There's that word rebellious again. Good to circle it. Good to take note of it at least. His woe upon rebellion. I don't know of a single person that's come to me with a testimony and said, the greatest thing I ever did in my life was rebel against God. (laughs) Oh, what limits he had me under. I just couldn't, you know, express myself and be who I am, you know, without rebelling against him. Rebellion always ends in deep, deep regret, and usually a person is badly scarred because of it. He said, woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, And here's the reason for his woe, who take counsel, but not of me. And so uh, he's talking about their dependence upon Egypt and depending upon Egypt for Egypt to deliver them from the hands of the Assyrian. And so he says again, woe to those who take counsel, but not of me, who and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. So he pronounces a woe upon those who wouldn't take his advice, who go down to Egypt, notice in verse 2, and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. In other words, that's all Egypt's going to be is a shadow. Shadow's there one moment, gone the next moment. You can't put any weight on a shadow. There's no substance to it. And that's what God said Egypt was going to be for them. But I mean, verse, uh, you know, two there. I mean, it's like a sanctified scorn in, in the thing. They walk to go down to Egypt and they have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. It's important when we find ourselves in difficult places. We have the same tendency to run to Egypt, but it's important for us to ask, what does the Bible say about this? What does God say that I should do in this situation? And here is God. He's looking at this and He's going, here I am sitting. You know, so often we complain about how much we have to wait on God. How much waiting does God do on us? Here He's got all of the resources, you know, times infinity, whatever that is, 
But I mean, all of this kind of thing, and, and all of this, and then he's got his people running to Egypt. The very people that he delivered them from at one time in their history, and in delivering them from Egypt, he proved himself to be greater than Egypt and the wisdom of Egypt and the gods of Egypt, and he drove that point home times one, times two, times three, times ten, as he humbled the gods of Egypt before his people, that they would never turn to to Egypt again. And the fact that he delivered you and me from this world, and he had the ability to do it, means that He is greater than this world. And He's greater than this world's wisdom. And He's greater than this world's strength. And so it's crazy, it's crazy to go back to what He has already proved to be infinitely inferior to Him. And yet it happens all of the time. How many of our lives here tonight don't? In a crunch, in a difficult situation, the first call goes to the rich uncle. God goes, I rate under the, I don't rate as high as the rich uncle now. What can I do? Or whatever it might be. And he loses out to all of these silly things. And he's waiting to give his wisdom. They have, I think that's one of the saddest things there in verse 2. And have not asked my advice. Imagine God saying that. I wasn't even asked my advice. And he said, therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame. What you think is going to be your deliverance, he said, by the time this all plays out, you're going to be ashamed of it. And trust in the shadow of Egypt and uh, shall be your humiliation. He said, there, it's going to be a humiliation once it all plays out. For his princes are at Zoan, and his ambassadors came to Hanez, and they were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them. And God's again saying, you're going to be ashamed because Egypt cannot benefit you, just as this world cannot benefit us or be help or benefit, but a shame and also a reproach. He says it's all going to end in shame, it's all going to end in humiliation. Anytime I take this book of God's and I disregard it for the wisdom of man, I can be sure that by the time that has played itself out, I'm going to end up humbled and I'm going to end up ashamed that I didn't call out to him in that situation. And that's what he's saying to them. I love what Paul wrote in the book of Romans, chapter 1. And he said on that theme of shame, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus said concerning shame, when he had called the people to him with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his own soul? And what will a man give in exchange for his soul? And then listen to this. Jesus said, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this wicked and adulterous generation Of him the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. And I love the strength of that passage in Mark chapter 8 because it reminds me of the complete folly of ever being ashamed of him and his word and his wisdom in this world. This world is a wicked world. This world is an adulterous world. It's this world that has 
everything to be ashamed of. We should never be ashamed of His Word. It should never be second, third, fourth, fifth choice within our lives. We have nothing to be ashamed of. But I love that. Sometimes, you know, you, the, you, the world will kind of silence or bully you or whatever. And Jesus says, don't let that happen. This world is an adulterous world. It's a wicked world. Don't be ashamed of my word. Not in this world. Not in this world. So I think that's beautiful. And I love the strength of it. God had clearly declared through Isaiah to the children of Israel over and over and over again that they were not to go to Egypt to help, but they were to go to the Lord. They were to go to the Lord. And they were just rebelling against Him in, in doing that. Uh, and so God says, that's, you're going to be ashamed and you'll be humiliated. And then notice in verse 6, this is, I mean, there's a, a pathos that's here that's the burden against the beasts of the south. And God said, through a land of trouble and anguish from which the lioness and the lion, the viper and the fiery serpent, and he's talking about um, down in the south, the Negev, the desert in the south uh, of Israel. He's talking about the animals that are there. And the Negev, of course, uh, borders up against Egypt. And God says, they carry their riches on the backs of young donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels. And here is God watching over the whole scene. And as He watches Jerusalem, and He sees Egypt, uh, you know, let's say He's watching Jerusalem over here, and He sees Egypt over here, and He sees this caravan of donkeys and camels carrying money from Jerusalem, God's money from Jerusalem, down into Egypt to pay Egypt for their help. And God watches the whole thing. He watches the whole caravan. And He says concerning this, they're going to a people who shall not benefit them, for the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore, I have called her Rahab Hem Shebeth. And so, here is God free. But they rejected my free counsel and advice in order to pay for counsel from Egypt. To pay for counsel from the world. Imagine paying for Egypt's protection, for Egypt's help, for Egypt's counsel when they could have had God's counsel for free. That's crazy. But it happens all of the time. All of the time. When just simple prayer and searching the Word of God and what the Bible has to say about a situation in my life becomes a last resort or it's something that I don't resort to. And God speaks to them and He looks and He says, you're going down and you're going to pay money to them. But He renames Egypt and He renames Egypt Rahab uh, uh, there in uh, verse 7. Rahab Hem uh, Shebeth. And that means Rahab, calling Egypt that, Rahab, the do-nothing. Because that's exactly what Egypt was going to do for Judah. Nothing. They were, going to do it. they were going to take the money of God's people and they were not going to help them one single bit. I wonder, I wonder on a daily basis all over the world, how much God watches that same scene occur. And how much of His money that He has blessed His people with ends up in the hands of Egypt when Egypt can't help us one bit. One bit. How much of his money goes into all of the self-help and all these different things. These things that He's willing to provide by His Holy Spirit, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. When He gives His Word, it's not just words on a page. He stands behind it Himself. And when He gives a promise to us and we stand on that promise 
His very character, His nature, His truthfulness is now at stake. He'll never let that promise fall to the ground in our lives. Never let it happen. It won't happen in our lives. And here we have these promises, we have these blessings, and they are free. They are our, ours in Christ Jesus. And then all of the money that floods out of our lives to buy these pathetic ten-step solutions that are fill every Christian bookstore. I love what Arthur Blessed said years ago as he came to the United States. He said, I travel all over the world, and I don't know how well Arthur's doing these days, but back then he was doing all right. He said, I travel all over the world, and he says, I come back to the United States, and he says, Christians here, they just wear me out. Got a word from the Lord, 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 from the Lord. I'm amazed at how willing Christians are to establish mediators. Roman Catholicism doesn't have anything on half of Protestants. The willingness to establish a mediator. Get something. And I like what his response, he said, he would continually say to them, yes, I have a word from you. Read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible and pray. It's amazing what will come out of a life as we just read his word and pray and stand on His Word and expect Him to stand behind His Word, and He will. The amount of God's money that's wasted for what He knows isn't going to do us any good. And there's a lot of good books in, you know, Christian bookstores, I suppose. I mean, I'm sure there are. And uh, and so, but I mean, you walk in, it's a, it's very troubling for me to walk into a Christian bookstore and to see the commentary section this wide. That is very troubling. That is very uh, troublesome for me. And uh, in, in our new church, uh, we'll have a dandy uh, commentary section. We do now. We do now. But they stock what sells. It's a reflection on the community. It's a reflection on us. It's not just a reflection on them. And then go over to the self-help section and watch it go on for aisles as people are looking for some snappy one, two, three Christianity. The amount of money that goes into it. Hmm. Might not be bad if we were just left with our Bibles for a while and see what would happen. I think wonderful things would happen. So God's heart was broken over this. And He said, now go, verse 8, and write it before them on a tablet and note it on a scroll that it may be for a time to come, forever and ever, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy lies to us. Get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. And so here are the rebellious people, and, and, and they're putting pressure now upon the prophets not to speak for God. And, and so they're saying to them, listen, if you have to speak, speak smooth things to us. Pos- positive things to us. Happy, p- p- perky things to us. But, but that's what we want. We want smooth things. And listen, if you don't have a smooth thing to say to us, a nice smooth sermon, then we'll settle for a lie. We'll settle for a lie. That's amazing, isn't it? Here's a group of people that they would choose lies over God's truth. And then finally they say in verse 11, they just said, we prefer silence to God's truth. Don't speak anymore to us. Don't speak. And so they didn't want to... Uh, receive God's teaching. And therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perversity and rely on them, therefore this iniquity shall be to you like a breach ready to fall, a bulge in a high wall whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant and he shall break it like the breaking of a potter's 
vessel which is broken in pieces he shall not spare, and so there shall not be found among its fragments a shard to take fire from the hearth or to take water from the cistern. And so God says their rebellion is going to end in a disaster. And he said that disaster is going to come swiftly. And so it's kind of like you got a, a wall that's been built to hold back the water, and all of a sudden you begin to see it's bulging in the wall. The, walls be, the integrity of the wall is beginning to give way. And once it gives way, boom, the whole dam goes. The whole thing washes away. And it happens just like that. He says the destruction that's going to come upon them is like smashing a piece of pottery. You ever take those pottery things and... Uh, and, you know, smash him as a kid. I hope you don't do him now in adult life, but it was something that got us through the summers for a while. So we broke them all, and then, you know, what do you do? But you break a piece of pottery like that, that fired clay, and you drop it down, and it just explodes in a bunch of pieces. And that's what he says is, is going to happen to them. And there's not going to be a piece big enough to take a coal out of the fire or to get a drink of water out of a, a water cistern from it. And so that was the judgment that was coming. And for thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved, and quietness and confidence shall be your strength, but you would not. And God was saying that just rest and salvation and quietness and confidence, all the things that they were wanting from Egypt, God said, you'll find them in me if you just return to me if you just return to me. Quit all of the other voices. Quit all of the other places. All the things you're looking for, I've got them right in my hand. I'll give them to you. In verse 16, he continues to talk about their rebellion. And you said, in light of God's offer, no, we will flee on horses. Therefore, we shall flee. And we'll ride on swift horses. And therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. They thought that you know, swift horses were the answers to their problems. And God said, One thousand shall flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall flee. To your left is a pole on the top of a mountain and a banner on a hill. In other words, you're going to be left alone. And so here was a promise that God had given them uh, in the law that if they obeyed Him, that a thousand would flee before one of them. God said, But if you disobey Me, a thousand of you will flee before one of your enemy. And this was exactly what God was going to keep that promise in their lives. In verse 18, God declares that He wants to be gracious to them. If they turn, therefore the Lord will wait that He may be gracious to you. I like that verse. The Lord longs to be gracious and He's willing to wait in, in order uh, to do that. Again, there's that uh, realization uh, how much you know, we're only conscious of how much waiting we think we do for God. And uh, it's good to be conscious of how much waiting God can do on us for us to turn His way in order that He might be gracious to us. And therefore, He will be exalted that He may have mercy on you. And I like that. It's kind of like He says, therefore, He shall win that He may have mercy on you. The greatest mercy that God can perform in my life is to win in my life. Not to let me win, but for Him to win for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for Him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. You shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When He hears it, He will answer you. And so God longs to hear their cry of repentance. And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teachers shall not be moved into a corner anymore, but your eyes shall see your teachers. Your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. And so God longed to be their teacher once again instead of all of these false teachers uh, that they had. God longed to give them instruction, tell them which way to turn or uh, take a wrong turn. He said, no, 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 you've got to go this way. And uh, it's good to have him have that place in our lives. You will also defile the uh, covering of your graven images of silver and the ornament of your molded images of gold. You will throw them away as an unclean thing. You shall say to them, get away. And so God uh, speaks to them and declares that you know one day they'll be ashamed of their idolatry 
verse 23, and then he shall give you, give the rain for your seed with which you sow the ground and bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plenteous. In that day your cattle will feed in large pastures. And likewise the oxen and the young donkeys that uh, work the ground will eat cured fodder which uh, has been winnowed with the shovel and fan. And there shall be on every high mountain and on every high hill rivers and streams of water. And the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall Moreover, the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of seven days in the day that the Lord binds up the bruises of His people and heals the stroke of their wound. And so God was desiring uh, to heal their land. And of course, a lot of this has uh, connotations as it relates to the millennial reign the thousand-year reign of Christ. But that's here's again the longing of the heart of God. I want to be your teacher again. I want to heal your land. I want to provide a living for you. I want to provide a prosperous life for you. And then his heart, uh, his message turns uh, to a judgment on Assyria. And it kind of seems out of place, but it's not out of place because what God is saying to the children of Israel is not only do I want to be your teacher, not only do I want to heal your land, but I want to fight for you. I want to fight for you. But you won't let me fight for you. Imagine, I mean, God you know, wanting to defeat their enemies and, and yet they wouldn't let Him uh, 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 fight for them. God doesn't want to fight against me. He wants to fight for me if I'll give Him a chance to do it. And that's what He was saying to them. I don't want to spend my time fighting against you. I want to fight for you. And so he declares uh, the, the deliverance that he wants and how he wants to fight for them uh, 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 against the Assyrians. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with his anger, and his burden is heavy. His, light, his lips are full of indignation, and his tongue like a devouring fou- uh, fire. Devouring fire. There we go. His breath is like an overflowing stream which reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of futility. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people causing them to err. And you shall have a song as in the night when a holy festival is kept and gladness of heart as when one goes with a flute to come to the mountain of the Lord to the mighty one of Israel. And so when God wiped out the Assyrians, they were very, very excited. They were, you know, broke out all of the instruments and there was a great celebration over Assyria's defeat. Everything but repentance. And the Lord will cause His glorious voice to be heard and show the descent of His arm with the indignation of His anger and the flame of a devouring fire with scattering tempest and hailstones for through the voice of the Lord... Assyria will be beaten down, who struck with a rod, and in every place where the staff of punishment passes, which the Lord lays on him, it will be with tambourines and harps, and in battles of brandishing, he will fight with it. For Tophet, which is a uh, reference to hell, was established of old. Yes, for the king it is prepared. It is made deep and large, and and, uh, its pyre is fire with much wood, and the breath of the Lord, like a steam of brimstone, kindles it. So he talks about hell. And the near fulfillment of that particular passage had to do with Sennacherib. Sennacherib is the king of uh, Assyria and fighting against God's people. And uh, God said, you know, Tophet is uh, established for people like you. And, uh, and that wouldn't turn to him. And then the far fulfillment in all of this, because some of this has a near and a far fulfillment. It dealt with the times of Isaiah's day. But the far fulfillment was a reference also to Satan as hell has been created for him and for his angels. And one day he will be a partaker of that. Well, we'll stop there tonight. and We'll pick it up in uh, chapter 31 uh, the next time that we're together. So much there. So much there. I trust that as the worship team comes forward in a moment to lead us in worship, that not a bit of rebellion in our lives would be able to withstand this warning. 
I trust that in all of our hearts, if God has not been a resort, if we haven't resorted to Him in prayer related to situations in our life or whatever, we're paying money all over the place for this and that and haven't come to Him, this is a great time to just settle that, let those things go by the wayside and cry out to Him. Reach out to the hem of His garment. There's still dunamis there. There's still a dynamic of His Spirit. There's still that healing touch. But let's reach out to Him with faith. And let's reach out to Him with a desperate faith as that woman with that issue of blood for 12 years. He's there. He knows what we need. And not only will He minister to us, but then He will commend us for our faith in Him. He's very real. He's very real and very eager to meet the needs within our lives tonight.